This week on episode 104 of the Music Biz Weekly, how fucked up can music licensing really be? You're listening to the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, your go-to resource for music marketing advice, music industry news, and discussion on the latest technologies in the digital music marketplace. Visit musicbizweeklypodcast.com for more information. And now, and now, and now. Please welcome your host, Michael Brandbold from Michael Brandbold Marketing, and Brian Thompson from Thorny Bleeder. Take it away, boys. Go! Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly. This is episode number 104, and I'm Brian Thompson from Thorny Bleeder and the DIY Daily. And of course, I've got Michael Brandvold with me. How's it going, dude? Not too bad, after we got through all the technical hurdles. I know, we were, you know, we often say this, but... Uh, Thank well, today- you, Microsoft. Yeah, massive Skype issues for me the last couple of days. In fact, yesterday I had to delete the whole thing and reinstall it and... Uh, anyway, um, I'm happy to be here with you. Oh, I'm touched. Or were you talking <laughs> to the listeners? <laughs> I'm talking to everyone. Thanks for pressing play, you guys. Uh, today's topic is how fucked up can music licensing really be? It can be it pretty can fucked be, up. It can be really fucked up. And we've, now got, that, we've got a couple actual, like, real-world examples that we... I, I know I've experienced myself, and I'm sure you have, too. So we're speaking from experience on this one. Yeah, you know, music licensing is something that everyone should... Every musician and anyone in the industry should be incredibly uh, concerned with and attentive to because there's a lot of potential money involved. But not only money, um, there's also a ton of promotional opportunities that can be affected through music licensing either going through or it being denied or copyright trolls who are piggybacking on um, licensing things that aren't uh, improper licensing in the eyes of certain copyright holders it's a real complicated convoluted mess and you know, because there's a lot of money at stake. And um, there's an article that appeared, I believe it was on Wednesday, just a couple days ago, on Tech Dirt that uh, really brought this to the forefront of my mind because um, it was about a UK music uh, podcast that is essentially going under because of copyright bullshit from uh, PPL, who is a, a music licensing um, company in the UK. And, you know, I, I, I want to just add, we're let's start off being clear. We're not opposed to copyrights, and we're not opposed to that protection and that licensing and, and all of that, because you need it. It's how you protect your music. What we're going to get into here is how it can actually become harmful if it's not done the right way it can put up roadblocks that can literally impact your band in making money or getting promotion yeah you know it's i well i am going to say personally i don't speak for michael but personally i think the the copyright system needs to be completely overhauled yeah and uh i think it's uh it's there's so much potential for abuse and there's a lot of harm being done with copyright right now copyright sorry copyright um copyright being misrepresented um there's so many trolls out there you may have heard the term copyright trolls and copyright trolls are companies who are taking it upon themselves to chase after people who are quote infringing on other companies copyrights for them on their behalf it's so complicated i don't even know if i'm making sense in my own head right now all i know is that for these copyright trolls and in the eyes of the courts quite often uh, not quite often always you're guilty until you can prove yourself innocent just by someone making a claim 
I've actually have had some personal experience in this with, uh, with the label that I run and with a band that I've worked with in the past. And it's caused tons of headaches. It's cost us legal fees. It's cost us, to this day, there's uh, some territories in the world that we have, um, haven't been able to collect our revenues from because of copyright claims that are untrue and unfounded. Yet, um, you're guilty until you can prove yourself otherwise. And not just by saying, hey, here, here's my document. No, it's like going to court and getting a lawyer to sit in on your, your behalf. And I mean, that's one of the reasons wh why uh, these copyright trolls are just so evil is because they know that they have the upper hand because they have the money and they're going after independents who don't. So, so let's go back to, go back to the article that, that you, were, you were mentioning because that'll be a good kickoff of an example of how copyrights are causing problems. Yeah, so this appeared in uh, Tech Dirt on I think it was April first, and the title of the we, we'll we'll put a link in the in the notes to this podcast. Um, but the title of the article was "UK Music Licensing Agency Says You Can't Use Its Music in Your Podcast Without First Purchasing a License That It Doesn't Even Offer." So, so do you do you, you guys get that? Uh, there, there, there's no big deal about. Well, I shouldn't say no big deal, but a lot of people say, yes, you have to buy a license if you want to use music. And most of them will say, here's how you do that. This company is saying you have to buy a license, and they don't offer you any solution to buy the license. So this you can't uh, use the music. Yeah. I mean, so what it is is that, um, you know, if you're going to be grabbing music um, from the library that's out there, especially from major labels and, well, I mean, you know, any label for, for that matter, um, you need a, a broadcast license to, to pay the royalties for, for what is, uh, for the music that you're being played. And it's different. There's so many different licenses, licenses involved. It's different if you're a terrestrial radio station. It's different if music is on YouTube on top of a moving image. It's different if it is um, on internet radio. It's different if it's on-demand streaming. It's different if it is a downloadable podcast. There's so many different types. And that's where, um, again, the old system starts to really convolute things and make everything really, really confusing. So here's this independent podcast in the UK. And they just, they, I think they've published something like 85 episodes so far. And they're being attacked by this music licensing firm, um, PPL, um, saying that they need this broadcasting license and, in and, order, and, and actually, I think what what happened was they went after the company that was hosting the media for this podcast, and basically said you can't serve up these shows anymore because they don't have a license to the shows. Right, right. That's exactly it. They, so didn't, they, they didn't actually reach out to the podcaster. They just went to basically the ISP, the hosting yeah. company, and said there's illegal content, unlicensed, being hosted. You've got to shut it down. So now, I mean, if you were to go to, and again, this is just a small fries independent podcast, uh, not unlike what Michael and I are doing. Um, well, it is unlike what Michael and I are doing is because we're not going after major label artists. We're not going after any signed artists. And that makes our life a lot easier because we're not having to jump through any copyright holders. We're going direct to the artist. Luckily, we've got a partner in Music X-Ray who is letting us connect with artists directly. Um, so we're, we're able to bypass a lot of this crap. But for Joe Blow, who just wants to have a hard rock podcast accumulating his uh, favorite tracks that he's discovered... Um, he's potentially going to be shut down by the old system or by copyright trolls. Well, and, and, and I can tell you that as a fact. So I've got another show called Dropping the Needle, which is a pure music show. And we occasionally have musical guests join us as a three-way video. And sometimes they'll do uh, an impromptu acoustic performance for us. The artist is fine with that. Um we have been informed by um, a record label rep that if any artists, <laughs> if any artists 
that we want. We're more than welcome. They'll bring all the artists we want. But if that artist is going to come on our show to promote their album, their tour, whatever it is, and do an acoustic performance, we, the podcaster, have to pay a, pay them, basically. We have to pay a license right. And this is an unmonetized Unmonetized. Podcast. We don't monetize this at all, and we're doing it to promote you. So it has been told to us that this label will do that. We have made a call. As the owners of the podcast, we will not promote any artists from that label. We don't want to even deal with the legal hassle of doing that. It's not worth it to us to try and do the licensing, to figure out what the paperwork is, to, you know, hey, I don't know, maybe it turns out that it's only a $10 fee. Fuck if I know. I don't know. We have just said it's not even worth the headache, so therefore any artist on this major label network are not going to get promoted. Now, now let's be clear. I mean, it's almost like they're it's they're saying that you can't play. They're not saying you can't, uh, or are they saying you can't even talk to the? No, artists? no. We we can have them come on and but just you can't talk. play their music. Yeah, we can't play their music, or they can't do. They can't pick up an acoustic guitar and sing. Well, that's actually bullshit because, um, in my mind, anyway. Again, I'm not a. a entertainment lawyer but for a record label they don't own the artist they own the recording of that of that that one per, of one performance they own a recording the that's on the cd right so um but for them to say that you um that you couldn't have them perform, perform it live that would then be the publisher who would say, okay, well, that's our song. So, again, so here's more, well, and, more confusion. And, and, where and, it's and like, again, this is, the, this is the confusion. So we are two guys doing this show for fun and hobby. We're not a business. We don't have lawyers. We don't have all this other. So we have just said, you know what? I'm not even going to figure out if they have the rights to do that to us. We're just not even going to deal with it. Right. And, okay. and, 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 and if you were a band... Unfortunately, I'm sorry you get bit in the ass because of that. Yeah. Well, now let's uh, let's talk about another thing where, um, again, on this other podcast that you have, you uh, you had Jordan Rudess from Dream Theater, who was once on this podcast as well, and um, so yeah, he was a guest on YouTube on because this is a podcast where he was, um, you know, a. Uh, an interview on YouTube. You guys were chatting back and forth, and we'll take it away. So, what so yeah, we chatted back and forth, and then he said, "I'd I'd be happy to do a, a an impromptu performance for you." And he's a he's a keyboardist. He doesn't sing. He doesn't play guitar. He's keyboard. So he went over to his keyboard and literally just made something up, and played for two and a half three minutes. Completely yeah. original. It's never been recorded. It's never off been the cuff. Just off jamming. the cuff. I mean, it was yeah. an amazing performance. Yeah. Upload that to YouTube. I get an immediate message back from YouTube saying, you need to show us you have the rights to that performance. My first question is, what are you... Now, first of all, you guys need to understand, YouTube is doing this automated. This isn't somebody who listened to it. It was some some matching or discovery algorithm that said, oh, we, we recognize a musical pattern in here. We're going to alert you that you may not have the rights. You may not have the rights to this, and you need to prove to us you have the rights. So you're guilty until proven innocent. So what did I do? I said, hey, Jordan, I need to prove the rights. Can you send me a message that says, I, Jordan Rudis, give this video, here's the URL, full rights to use my performance. And I sent that off to YouTube. YouTube sent me a message back. This is all automated saying, we have reviewed your, your submission and, and we determined that you don't have the rights. We have determined that you're full of shit. <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 my jaw dropped. I'm just like, what, what so rights? I got, all, the, I got the artist who gave me permission to use it for a, reco- a, a performance that was never recorded. So you can't even match that against a publisher's database, a record label database. It can't match anything. So again, so here is, um, it's YouTube. This isn't even a record label. It, it's YouTube saying, um, you, you, you blew it, and we're not going to let you do anything with this video. Meanwhile, it's yours. It's your content. 
And that, that music that was played, it has never been recorded. It was a live jam. It's live. It's never, ever been committed to tape anywhere before. It's not a song, so there's no publishers involved. What the fuck? I know, what the fuck? It, and it, it's 100% automated, so there was no way for me to make a dispute against right. this claim. Now, they didn't shut the video down. They didn't pull the audio out. They just said, we're letting you know we know and you don't necessarily have the rights, but you're okay right now. I mean, I think it's one of these things where if you do this too many times and you get too many strikes, then they start pulling it out. Well, what they probably did is if you had your that video monetized... Oh, they, they video, definitely turned off monetization. Right. So that's that's the thing they that YouTube definitely does. definitely turned that So, off. I mean, for example, I mean, and with Jordan, uh, with him, I don't know how many hits that would have had on your podcast, that, but that probably one, that quite one, a that's few. Ten, that's ten, it's had 10,000 views. Well, I mean, there's some there's some ad dollars there that uh, guess what? YouTube doesn't have to pay out anymore. Now, now here's where this gets really. Do you great. think they would if you did prove it? Do you think they would retro retroactively pay you? No, no way would they have gone. Good back. luck with that. No, no way. So here's where it gets even more interesting, is it it just it proves how how flawed the system that they're trying to install right now is. So we did another show, and we had uh, a member of the 80s band Honeymoon Suite on. And they were signed to a major label. They had a huge major hit on radio MTV called New Girl Now. The lead guitarist played and sang that song on video. We posted that. Nothing. YouTube didn't flag it, didn't note it, did nothing. So there was something where I'm like, now that should have been flagged. Meanwhile, you've got a company like Groove Shark who is doing all sorts of crazy copyright stuff that, I, I mean, I personally don't have a problem with it. I'm just comparing like situations um, because I just... You know, I, I'm I like content to be open and and whatnot. Um, so here's a little podcaster being shut down. Yet Groove Shark, who's making millions off of the backs of uh, content that just random Joe Blows are uploading and making available, they're okay. And 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 I want to make it clear that again. You should have protection of your music, but you also need to understand what somebody might be doing because they own or control that protection. I'm doing these shows to promote these bands, to let them promote shows, albums, whatever they're doing. It's a pure promotional vehicle. And in doing that, somebody who might control your copyrights might be stepping in and saying, you know what, don't. You can't do that. And, 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 and at the end of the day, who's really going to get burned the most? Sorry to say it's going to probably be the artist because you're not going to get some promotional opportunity. Yeah, I think it, really what we're talking about here is in the long run, if you are or when you are signing a publishing deal or distribution deal or maybe you're actually signing a, a real record label deal, you need to really, this is another thing for you to be aware of and to ask questions. Ask a question of your lawyer, because you better have a lawyer who's representing you. Ask that lawyer, what, what is that label, what is that person, what is that company getting by me signing this? What rights am I giving away? Do they become, I think we talked about it on an, on an old episode of Rockstar Branding, where remember there was a heavy metal label that, That's right. that signed a heavy metal band, and in doing so, they assigned the rights to some third-party company, and that third-party company took it upon themselves to go sue the band's fans for downloading the music illegally. The yeah. band and the manager were 100% okay with the fans doing this, but it didn't matter because unbeknownst to them, those rights had been assigned to somebody else. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, again, I, I don't claim to be an entertainment lawyer and every territory is different the way it works in canada is different than it is in the u.s the way it is different in denmark or germany or japan or australia or the uk it's different everywhere so um you need to dive in and start figuring out what 
um, what do you really need to know? And start getting educated on this topic. Um, what What's happening with your music? Because, again, me as the person who's promoting you, I'm going to take the path of least resistance. I'm not going to try and fight something that I might have the rights to do. I'm just going to say no. I don't want to do it. And the thing that really bothers me is the, the, the oh, even the bigger picture here is the inflexibility of the old music system. That's really what's at play here. Again, these are copyright laws that are decades old that haven't been updated or hardly updated since the internet came into being, um, let alone streaming, um, podcasting. I mean, podcasting's been around for a decade now. Like, why doesn't PPL in the UK, why do they not have a podcast license podcast by license. now. Like, come on. Like, we, it's been around for at least a decade. There, why is the old guard not reacting? Because they're, who knows? I mean, let's say, who knows? Maybe that podcast that went under, maybe it would have been affordable for them to buy a license if it was there. I was but, just going to say, if that was the case, I, I, speaking for myself, if this major label had just said, you know what? Here's one click form, drop in a PayPal address, and you're going to get charged some minimal amount. I mean, I'm not talking hundreds of dollars. I'm not going to spend hundreds of dollars to acquire the rights to play some music to promote a band. But if it's a small amount and it's very easy and painless, I'll do it. I'll do it. But that's not the case. That is not the way it works. Yeah. And it's, it's again, it's, uh, it's how um, the people who, uh, you know want to really support the music the most the independent grassroots scene um they're always often left out in the cold just like not sure what to do um you know it's the, it's the small indies that that often get burned because as you said the big ones like groove shark who have legal funds and staff they can deal with it and they can fight it and the little people like you and me we don't have it, so we've got no options. Um, Tech Dirt is a really great resource if you guys are interested in this topic more. Tech Dirt has so many articles talking about the ongoing struggles of um, the new digital economy and the old copyright system. Um, strongly urge you to go and check it out. They've got so many articles, and yeah. they're you know every week they, they've got new news on it. Um, now, this doesn't, what we're not talking about here is about licensing your music to a TV commercial or to a movie or to a game. That's not at all what we're talking about. It's, that's a completely different process, completely different. What we're talking about is a lot of this automation that's going on where um, it, it's, there aren't humans talking it's yeah. just you robots can, you can't even find a human to say in this case you screwed up with jordan rudis and i know if i got you on the phone you would understand what i'm saying but there is no person there and another thing uh there's a video that i uploaded um i don't know a couple months ago on youtube where it said that um just letting you know we noticed that your video has this track yep. i'd never heard of the artist before so they removed monetization from that video um, for me if for, as part of getting, receiving ad revenue because they thought it, con it contained a track that I'd never even heard of. There wasn't even music on it. I, I, it so um, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I, think, I think what it shows is a couple different things. There are people out there who might acquire these rights and abuse it. And there's there, and, and then – then there's just a system that's in place right now that isn't working efficiently. I'm just, I, I'm very concerned about copyright trolls um, being given more power and more flexibility because they, in my mind, are evil, evil, evil companies. I completely agree. Because they don't own any copyrights themselves. What they do, and there's a couple of companies in each territory that are really that just that's all they do. So what they would do is they would knock on a copyright holder's door and say, hey, by the way, do you mind 
If we go if, collect money on your behalf. If we go collect money on your behalf for people that are using your music without your knowledge or permission, and they'll be like, okay. So then this jerk-off copyright troll company just goes nutso over the internet looking for anybody who might have done something with or without a license. Well, and, whether and, and, and let's be honest. They are they're operating in an automated mode as well. Nobody is clicking into YouTube and clicking on each video and personally listening. They've got discovery and matching software that looks for audio fingerprints. You know, and this isn't the copyright tools. Also, they're not just looking for for audio. They're looking for movie files. They're looking for images. Anything that potentially has a copyright, they're out there. Just raping the internet trying to like uh gather up uh, like they issue people threats saying in fact i read yesterday a story about uh a blogger who i actually was talking on the phone with a couple of weeks ago a copyright troll hit him for using an image that he didn't get uh the right license for and it wasn't the company who created the image it was one of these copyright trolls who sent him an email saying, we noticed this image is on your site. You owe us $795 for it. And he, he, so he sent a, a, a reply going, well, I, I removed it. <laughs> Sorry, you know, I'm just a little blogger. And uh, they're like, yeah, that's nice and all. Thank you for doing that. But we actually still have to charge you for the time that it was on your site. And again, this wasn't even the company. This was a troll company. So he doesn't have the means to fight this. So now he's got this $800 bill for using an image that was in a blog post. To promote something. Well, yeah. I, I mean, remember, at the end of the day, guys, a lot of what this is doing is using your music to promote you in some way. Somebody else is saying, I want to put your clip, your video in something I'm doing because I'm promoting you. Well, and beyond that, I think the real big picture that is echoed daily on Tech Dirt is internet freedoms. There is, our internet freedoms are at risk because if we let these copyright trolls go too far with um, assumptions that they're making with licenses and laws, um, it can change the entire dynamics of how everything is online, including all of those little images that you click share on, whether it be on print Pinterest or you do a retweet or you do an image search on Google and you just click and drag it to your desktop. Guess what? Now you're a thief. <laughs> you did a Google image search. You took an image, you put it on your desktop, and maybe you use a, that picture of a flower somewhere. Well, now you could potentially be liable as well. It, it's, uh, so there has to be some uh, reality and there has to be some, uh, I don't know, some concepts of malicious intent put in place, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, to me, I always look at that, that concept of malicious intent is if I took your music and I put it into something that I'm turning around and selling... Right. Then, by all means, you should get a cut of whatever is happening, or it should be removed. Yeah. But I, you know, I still come back to as the podcaster doing a podcast. I want you on my show to promote your new album or to promote your tour, and I'd love to have you do a performance. And I can't pay you for that. And quite honestly, the artists are always okay. The artists approve and give us the approval. So it's somebody beyond them that's going to say no. Yeah, well, I mean, the artists aren't worried about uh, some podcast that might be getting five or 10,000 hits of really hardcore music fans. They're concerned about the, the big major networks who are completely just using their content to make money yep. to ma through their advertising means or whatever. I mean, the music industry... Um, a lot of it is bands become famous because of tastemakers. It's always been that way from fanzines. I mean, in a very, this isn't a great parallel, but I'm going to draw it anyway. It's like, it's like, think back in the seventies or the eighties. If, uh, 
if somebody who owned a fanzine was told that they're not allowed to talk about this band because Led Zeppelin, because their name that you need a license to use their name, right? So I know it's it doesn't really it's not a very good parallel, but in terms of um, the impact on culture and the impact on grassroots advertising, I think it is kind of parallel because there was no other means for independent promotion by fans other than fanzines or making mixtapes. Well, there is a parallel. I mean, what if uh, I mean mixtape culture was huge, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what if all of a sudden, you know, somebody who created a mixtape was tracked down in the seventies and was given an eight hundred dollar bill well, or an eight hundred? We, we we all know that home taping was going to destroy the music industry in the seventies and eighties. I, yeah. I mean that 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 was evil, and I, and I grew up in that era. I remember seeing the ads. I remember hearing the debate that home taping. You are criminals. You don't have the rights to do that. Yeah, well, and there's even a logo that I'm sure many of you all will remember. It's a picture of a cassette with a skull and cr- with the crossbones behind it. I, 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 um, bought, I bought an album like a year ago at a used record store, and inside was an insert that was promoting, you know, turning in home tapers. Yeah. And it basically said, call your local Bunko squad if you find somebody who's taping music. So they wanted... <laughs> So the music industry wanted people to... Turn to in your best friend. Turn in your best friend who maybe recorded that song um, off of his sister's vinyl. It, it's, it's ridiculous. I um, mean, you know, we, we've said it repeatedly here. I, I think you just, as an artist, you need to try and be aware of who might have rights and control over your music. And, and make sure you have some understanding of what they're doing on your behalf. See if you can be involved in the decision-making. Don't just blindly sign those rights away and, you know, let them make that call because they're, they're not going to make a call that's going to be in the best interest of your career. They're going to make a call that's going to be in the best interest of them collecting some revenue. Well, and, yet, and even beyond that, it's... Uh... <sighs> Internet freedoms, you know, um, this, it's, it's, the internet isn't going away and we need to keep it as free and open as possible so that it's not being, you know, taken advantage of by these massive conglomerates. And there needs to be some realism injected into the laws and uh, we need to be, I mean, how many bullshit laws were tried to be passed by uh, by the American was it Congress last year? Like Act was it ACTA was one of them. SOPA was another. So, so, oh yeah, you remember that when they wanted a, a yeah. I mean, there's, I mean there's, that's those are the things that keep on. If we're not aware, if we're not conscious, if we don't read these they, articles they as they pop up, in. they'll just try and slide them through. So this is just kind of a waving a bit of a red flag here, like. Pay attention, you guys, and when you see these articles pop up, um, sometimes there's petitions you may need to sign. Um, you know, it's uh, it was our voice, the collective voice, that made SOPA uh, get hammered down last year. And uh, then it would try to make its way up into Canada, and it was hammered down as well. But it's not going to stop. It's going to keep on coming back with a new name, with probably no changes in the bill itself. So uh, we need to be aware of this stuff. And um, like Michael said, we need to also, for you musicians out there, be aware of what uh, what's involved with the contracts you're signing. And um, Read the fine print. I mean, we can't stress that enough. I, I get that question all the time, especially related to all those Reverb Nation contests, where it's like, submit a song to enter this contest to win a chance to play at this tour. And, you know, the question's always, does that make sense? Should I do that? I don't know, but why don't you read the fine print to see what happens to your song when you submit it to them? That is a great point, because there is some radio station contests who, when you appear on their compilation because you've won something, a band search or whatever, they own... That song. That song. They can do whatever they want. Now... 99 times out of 100, nothing's ever going to come of that. But if you become that one band 
who becomes big, they've got a song that they can monetize and you won't see a dime off of it. Bon yeah. Jovi broke that way. That's right. He was uh, that he, was an he, in, that was he, a demo, wasn't he, it? He had a song. I, I can't remember the radio station, but I he had a Runaway. song placed. Yeah, on a radio station compilation album. Yeah. Now I don't know the rights, but that's just a perfect example yeah. of what happens if you became Bon Jovi, and that song they can go off and monetize it, and they can sell it, and they can license well, it, and you get no control over it. And and more recently, even though it's not that recent now, but uh, Nickelback. Um, Leader of Men was on Vancouver's C, uh, C Fox compilation. Um, now, again, I don't know. I'm not. This isn't a comment on on who had the rights on, for that song, that compilation. But I'm saying, if you are participating in one of these competitions, just read the fine print, and not just read it because little words. Like th- at the start of the podcast, I mentioned how I was and to some extent, still am embroiled in some copyright bullshit that's going, been going on for seven years now. Um, one word. Can, can make a big difference. One word. In my reality, that word was commonwealth, which changed the entire dynamic of that contract. Yep. And uh, to this day, it's still something that we're that we're fighting against. One, and one word can have a deeper meaning than the common assumed meaning, right? And that so, deeper meaning has legal binding. It can screw you over. So even by you just reading it, doesn't mean that you're all good and clear. Get a lawyer to read it. So I mean, because if you're not aware of a certain what that phrase means, or it's if it's uh, it's how it, what it means within that context. You're screwed. So uh, anyway, I guess this was our scary podcast. Scary pod. Do we have homework <laughs> out of this? What kind of homework could there be? Um, you know what? Uh, this, is kind uh, of a, this is kind of a legally one that I don't know if there's homework related to this. I just really, you know, I want you guys to uh, go to Tech Dirt, and I, I've got nothing to promote here. It's just, uh, to me, they're the site that um, is most on top of it. Um, maybe bookmark it and, you know, check it, check out some of the stuff that they pump out every week. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe just a simple answer question. Are you guys, would you guys be okay if some podcast wanted to take one of your songs and use it and air it and prom- to promote you? Are you personally fine with that without any form of payment or compensation? Well, I think most people would say. Uh, well, you know. I, I would hope most people would say yes, but it would be interesting to find out if there's anybody that's like, eh, no, I want to be compensated if they're going to play it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. All right, you guys. Um, let's roll into. Thanks for tuning in um, and share this podcast. Of course, if you if you, this connected with you, if it meant anything to you, please head share o- it. On- head over to iTunes. Please leave us reviews and ratings on iTunes. It helps. It means a lot. The more it gets rated and reviewed, the more iTunes is going to pay attention and take notice and maybe give us a good placement on the podcasting section of iTunes. Yeah, you never know. Um, So thanks again, you guys. Uh, And as always, we're now going to move into the featured track of the week. <laughs> so this week's featured uh, band of the week is called No Blitz. That's N O B L I T Z or sorry for you Americans Z. <laughs> Why do we say that letter differently than every I I don't know. Anyway, New No Blitz uh it looks like they're from Arlington, Virginia and uh this band sent their track to us on uh, our Music X-Ray Dropbox, which is exactly what you need to do if you want your song to be featured on this podcast as well. Um they're an American hard rock band that delivers in your face guitar riffs, driving drum beats and catching melodies. Um they're uh They've got, uh, just go go pay them a visit online. I'm not going to read their bio to you. You can read it for yourself. Here's a kick-ass rock, rock track, though. Find them at noblitz.com. You can also find them on Facebook at facebook.com slash noblitz. And here is Never Satisfied. We'll see you next week. Every number
This podcast is brought to you by Music X-Ray, which builds the tools to help artists get deals, get fans, and get better. At Music X-Ray, when you upload your songs, they automatically match them to real music industry opportunities for free. They then give you direct access to the decision makers, guaranteeing that they not only listen, but respond as well, for real. Additionally, they pre-match your songs to potential fans who are targeted based on their musical taste, fans which you can then contact and add to your very own database. And you're never shooting in the dark, because Music X-Ray gives you GPS-like tracking for your songs, which shows you the impact each of them is having on your career goals. Go to musicxray.com, create a free account, and check it out. You've been listening to the Music Biz Weekly Podcast with your host, Michael Bramvold from Michael Bramvold Marketing and Brian Thompson from Thorny Bleeder. Visit musicbizweeklypodcast.com for more information.